if we asked each person like what their earliest memory is, everybody would give a, give a, a difference, a different answer. And like at what age, everybody would give a different answer. And a lot of times, I talk to people, and they're like, "I can't remember anything before the age of ten or before the age of this." Now, for me, I, I have a lot of um, memories of my childhood, but I can truthfully and honestly say the earliest memory I have is when I was three years old. I am now 44, so it's 41 years ago. I remember at, at three years old, and I, I just, I don't want to brag, okay, and um, I, uh, this is going to be news to Julie, um, but um, I had a girlfriend at the age of three years old. Now, I don't remember her name. I probably should, but I don't remember her name. I remember she had blonde, curly hair. And I remember this one time she came into Miss Hazel's class. I still remember my teacher's name. Came into Miss Hazel's class, and she had a new shirt. Now, her new shirt was a tube top. That means it was cut off from the belly down. You know, like what well, L-Dog wears a lot of times. <laughs> and she said, Jimmy, what do you think of my new shirt? And my response was, where's the rest of it? I believe that's the last time I talked to that girl. Our relationship ended at that moment. But that's my earliest memory. Now, I also remember at four years old, my mom, she was the kindergarten teacher at Oleander Church of God at their school, and my grandfather was the pastor. Now, I was in pre-K. I was four years old, and pre-K started an hour later than kindergarten. So my mom would drop me off at my grandfather's house. He lived in the parsonage next door. And I would spend the hour with him, and there is where my grandfather taught me the art of playing hooky. Now, if you don't know what playing hooky is, that means skipping school. And oftentimes, he would say, Jimmy, do you want to play hooky? And I was like, duh. And we would go to, where, um, to this restaurant. is over there where Sweeties is now. Um, before it was Denny's, it was a restaurant called Sambo's. And we would go there and eat. And I remember eating these, these pancakes there with my grandfather. And we did that almost every morning to the point where we called each other breakfast buddies. Now, I remember in pre-K, the teacher handing us these papers and said to color on them and we're going to make coffee mugs. He said, we're going to make these coffee mugs and you can make them to anybody. You can make them to your mom, your dad, and I knew right away who I was going to make it to. I was going to make a cup for my breakfast buddy because he liked coffee. So I took this paper and I colored it. My mom, she came over. She was the kindergarten teacher, but she was there. She was helping. And um, I made this cup, it, we took this paper, put it in plastic, and I gave it to my grandfather. Now, my grandfather died about six years ago. And um, after he died, my sister, she was going through his stuff, and she brought me this cup that I made for my papa, my breakfast buddy. Now, looking at this cup, I was four years old, so obviously I didn't know how to write, so this was definitely my mom's handwriting, and there's a little sun right there, probably, that has Duetta Lloyd's um, handmanship all over it. But all these colored, scribbly lines, that was all me, okay? All right, Steve? So that's all me. Now, 36 years later, my grandfather still had this cup. And as I was thinking about how to start this message, last night I had my message all written down. I was going to start it a different way. And I remember this cup, and then I went into the closet looking for it, woke Julie up, okay? I tell you, I got a good wife. She didn't yell at me or anything. She just put the pillow over her head. I mean, I was knocking stuff over. Like, it is a mess that she's going to have to clean up when we get home. <laughs> but... He kept this, 36 years, this cup is 41 years old. And I was thinking, how we treat the creation says a lot about how we feel about the creator. And God, I, God has sent me on this journey where some things that I never really noticed or really even paid attention to, of the things of God's creation that I, at times, did not treat so well. This earth, I remember thinking before I would either be eating a, a Butterfingers, and I'd be like, I don't want this Butterfinger wrapper here in my truck, and I'd roll down the window and throw it out. Not proud of those moments. Fast forward to now, I'm ordering little claw things that you pick up trash so me and my kids can go around the neighborhood picking up trash. I'm walking through Home Depot and Walmart 
parking lots picking up trash because it's like, I want to take care of this place that God has given us. And, his, and if we're going to his creation, that means each other, right? God didn't just create me. He created all of us, including L-Dog and Stacy. And sometimes we don't treat other people, God's creation, the best, right? And there, so God is bringing me through this journey of just paying attention and thinking, man, how I treat the creation says a lot about how I feel about our creator. Now, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this may surprise some of you to know that here in Genesis chapter 1, we are not reading Eve's diary. This is not a journal that Adam put here. This is, this is a story that was told over generation, over generation, over generation, told down the years, and then several years later, this Hebrew writer of Genesis decided to write this story out. Whether he was enlightened, whether he was, it was something that was passed down, however it was, he decided to write this down. It was not something that was written as it went. Now, Jewish writers, Hebrew writers, ancient Hebrew writers wrote in a specific way. Most of them wrote in, um, in poetry. That was just the way that they wrote. When they would write a story or tell, there would be poetry there. There would be things that were hidden in. There would be, there would be parallel things that would run parallel. There would be patterns in the poem. And here in Genesis chapter 1, we see this Hebrew parallel poem on full display. Now, Genesis chapter 1, you can turn there if you want, or you can look up here on the Sky Bible. Either way is fine with me. I will not get upset. Um, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless. Now God, now you may be, this may surprise some of you especially Willis, that this Hebrew poem, this Hebrew story, originally was not written in English. It's Hebrew. It's a Hebrew poem. All right, just needed to clear that up. So in Hebrew, the word God would be written out like this. took me a long time with a Sharpie marker to get that just perfectly down. Now, if you would... Now, if that translated into English, it would be Elohim. Elohim. I, I had a marker here. This is my, can everybody see this, this whiteboard up here? This makeshift whiteboard, everybody can see it? Elohim. All right. E-L-O-H-I-M. That, that would be, that's God there. Now, Elohim. Then it goes on. It says, he created. Now, Create in Hebrew is this word bara. Bara. And then it says that he created, he created into, uh, into a wasteland, into, um, into, um, into this wasteland. Now that would be translated, I'm going to try to do it without looking. This Hebrew word, tohu v'bohu. Tohu v'bohu. And even if I got it wrong, you most likely don't even know. I could just be making it up. Tohu v'bohu. So, now, as we read this, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Here in... Verse 1, we see that God, Elohim, first is a creator. Then, in verse 2, we see that Elohim is spirit, spirit hovering over the waters. Then, in verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. So now we see that Elohim, God, is word. He's three in one, right here in the first three verses of the Bible, we see the oneness of God. It's like this communal spirit of coming together to create something. 
uh, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, now isn't it interesting, there is evening, and there is morning. Because usually, wouldn't we say, woke up in the morning, and then we went into the evening, but here, in this Hebrew story, it's evening to morning. Interesting. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters and separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening and there was morning. There it is again, the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let the dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and gathered waters. He called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees, and land that bear fruit and seed in it according to their various kind. And it was so. And the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed and according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, third day. And God said, let there be lights in the, in the vault of the sky to separate day from night and let them serve as a sign to mark sacred times in the day and the years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he also made the stars. God set the vault of sky to give light on earth to govern the day. Am I reading this over again? Am I? I'm good, okay. Seems like a lot of the same stuff. Interesting. To govern the day and night and to separate the light from darkness, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with the living creatures and let birds fly above and earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and moves about in it according to the kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning. The fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kind and livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals according to each of its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kind, and all the creatures that move along along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts on the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, six day. Now we go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work and he had been doing. And on the seventh day he rested from all his work. That, my friend, is a lot of scriptures. Next time I'm going to go just to the Bible app, push play, put the microphone on it, and just let it read it. Way easier. Now, in this, if this is, in fact, a Hebrew poem, if this is the, the Hebrew writer wrote this story in poetic form, we would see then different parallel things, people, things connecting to each other, and we would... We would see different patterns. So we're going to see this if we, if we do or not. First of all, day one. What happened in day one? What was created in day one? You can talk on this. This is freedom to speak. He created the heavens and the earth, and he created, so he, heavens, 
earth created light, correct? Let there be light. Day two. What he created on day two. Separated the waters from the sky. So waters and sky. So here he separated light from dark. He's the water from the sky. How about day three? What do you do on day three? Land. Somebody said land? Yep. Separated the land from water. So land from water. Then, how about in day four? What happened in day four? Now, sun, moon, and stars. But he created the light on the first day. Then he created it. So the sun, the moon, and the sky, so that we can govern day and night. I find it interesting that the thing that we govern our days and nights with was not created until the fourth day. Now, if you are like me and you think about that too much, your head will start to hurt. Day five. What happened on day five? All right, you guys are all with me here. He, birds go in the sky. Fish go in the water. Thank you very much. It's been real. Day six. What happens on day six? He creates animals that are on the ground. Mankind. And then how about on day seven? Day seven, he rested. Now, now, in this, there's this, 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 this kind of this cadence, this, this, this groove that's going on here. He, he, day one, it ends in evening, morning. Day two, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning. It goes six times. It gets to day seven. He rested. You see, no evening, morning. Day seven just kind of continues on. Now, let's see if there's any patterns here. Well, day one, day one, day two, and day three, if we separate these days, these days, he separated. Separated light from dark, water from sky, land from water. Now, these four days, the next, I mean, I'm sorry, the next three days, he filled, filled. I know. Filled. I got to pronounce my words. I know. I had a lot oh, that, of how I say naked. Naked. That's how you say it. I don't care who you are. So he separated. First three days, he separated. Second three days, he filled that which he separated. Three, creator, spirit, word of Elohim. We see a three. Three and three. Here's a pattern of threes. Now, how about this? How about, can we connect these in any way? Well, in day four, it parallels to day one because he separates light from dark. In day four, he creates the moon, the sun, the moon, and the stars that the light shines through. Day two, he separates the water and sky. On day five, he fills the sky and the water with birds and sea animals. Day three, he separates the land from the water. Day six parallels with day three because now there is land animals and there are people that walk on the land. All of this is connecting in some way. So we see the patterns of three. Now, is there any other patterns that we can look at? Is there any other patterns that we can see? Well, the first in Hebrew, the first verse of Genesis is seven words. The second verse in Genesis in Hebrew is 14 words, seven times two. The word earth is mentioned in this story in Genesis 1, in the story 
is mentioned 21 times, seven times three. The, um, in this, the, God appears, thir- in this story, God appears 35 times, seven times five. The, the words, um, in the seventh paragraph of Genesis, in the Hebrew, the word, there's 35 words, seven times, five. The, um, the words, God saw, the phrase God saw was appeared seven times. It was so appears seven times. So all through this story, we see patterns. We see sevens and patterns of seven. Now, the question is, is there any tens? Because three plus seven equals ten. Thank you very much. So, if you have time to figure out if there is any tens and patterns of tens in this story, what you would find is the phrase to make appears ten times. According to their their kind appears ten times. God said appears ten times. Three times relating to people, seven times relating to creatures. Uh, Let there be appears ten times, three times in heaven, seven times on earth. You may start to think that this writer had some help, maybe, as we see these patterns. And we see as it goes evening, morning, as like God is saying, come out of the dark and into the light, evening, morning, evening, morning, and each day, Each day that he creates, it gets more complex and more complex and more complex. It's almost as if God is pushing this whole thing forward. So, this cool thing that's happened with me lately is something that I have never been interested in is anything to do with science. I, chemistry, biology, any of those subjects in school, I will tell you 100%, I made Ds because I didn't care. I just wanted to pass. But now as God's doing something, and, and I, I came across this, this story of this atheist scientist, and he started doing these things and figuring things out. And he says every time we, we got answers to one thing, it would create more answers or more questions. And then we'd find answers to those and then more questions. And he said, I got to a place where I was just like, they're just, there's more. And he said that it just pointed to improved all of his studies that there is unquestionable a God because of all these things just coming together. Now, our universe. How many know, how many know the name of our universe? Milky Way. Milky Way, yes. Yes. Yes, Miss Ann, it is not just a candy bar. The Milky Way. Now, our In the universe, there are over two billion galaxies. Over two in in the universe. Now, in each galaxy, there are over two billion, and if I didn't write billion right, forgive me, okay, a D in science, and most likely DMF. There are over 2 billion stars. We're, we are all... We are all, all special in our own way. Obviously, the star is a can be a friend of SpongeBob. <laughs> now, in our galaxy alone, we have over 100 million black holes, which is why sometimes on Saturday afternoons you get a little down. 100 just in our universe alone. Now. They have found that in our universe, in the Milky Way, there is this planet, this planet that is moving through our galaxy at 67,000 miles an hour. 
And not only is this planet moving 67,000 miles an hour at the same time, it is spinning and rotating at the speed of 1,000 miles an hour. And this planet that we are talking about is called Earth. Now, nine, I've got to get, make sure I got this right. 93 million miles from Earth is this thing called the sun. Now, the sun gives the Earth 99% of its energy. It comes from the sun. Now, the sun being 93 billion miles, here's the thing. The sun was 92 billion miles away, no life. If the sun was 94 billion miles away, no life. Also, the earth is tilted on this axis of 23.5 degrees. Other planets in our galaxy? Earth. And if it wasn't for this tilt, on one side, it would be exposed too much to the sun, and it would get hotter and hotter and hotter, and no life. The other side that was not exposed to the sun would get colder, colder, and colder, no life. The atmospheric pressure on Earth is 21% oxygen. If the atmospheric pressure, if it was 19%, no life. If it was 23%, no life. Now, the oceans. How many of you like going out to the, to the ocean? You like going out there? The ocean is how much like, how many of you like drink in the ocean? Yeah, nobody likes doing that, right? 3.4% salt. Our bloodstream, 3.4% salt. If it was any less or any more, no life. And through there are hundreds and hundreds of statistics like this. It's as if somebody is up there turning the dial to make sure everything is perfect. And if one of those things are off, it will put all of them off and no life. It's as if something or somebody is holding all of these things together. And that's why there are scientists after scientists after scientists saying, there is no other explanation except there's more. A lot of these scientists are sounding a lot like ancient Hebrew writers and prophets saying there's, there's, there's just more out there. Now, you and I are made out of this thing called cells, right? Cells. So there are, I'm running out of board really quick. We are, this is you and I, right there. Here's Larry, the dreadlocks. What? Oh, good. So we're made up of cells. Now, every second your body is making and reproducing red cells and white cells. And in fact, two, every second, 2 to 10 million red blood cells are changing or reproducing, and 100 million white blood cells are. Now, what? tells these cells to make more of Jimmy instead of Denise. Well, it's that each one of these cells is, has a DNA, six, the six-foot-long DNA, if you could take it out of a cell, and it tells the cell exactly who to make and to continue to make Jimmy. So it's made out of cells. Now, cells are made out of molecules. Molecules are made out of atoms. Oh, man. By the way, the, me the title of my message, giving all the credit to Julie, Between the Atoms. Last week it was Between the Trees, Between the Atoms, all Julie. You can thank her later. Now, used to they thought the atoms was the smallest thing in this universe, but now the atoms, they find out in 1890, I believe it was, J.J. J. Thompson and his crew, they started dividing, dividing atoms, and they found that there are sub- subatomic particles. Now, this is they kept dividing them and they found that there's over right as of right now over they have come up with over 100 subatomic particles trying to find these building blocks 
to life. And what they have come up with is all these building blocks is all of this that we're all made out of is a relationship of energy. A relationship of energy. Have you ever been talking to somebody and you felt like after talking to them, like some, they, they just, like that conversation just lingered. It just stayed with you after you were gone. How many ever, you've ever talked to, here, let me. Now, Kinsley, she says that this is the galaxy, not an atom. Amazon says atom. So, all right. Katie, come here. I want you to hold this atom. Be very careful with it. Nan, I'm going to hold this. Now, when Katie and I are talking, they have found that when we are talking, there is so much going on in between. And right here, right here in this space is a space that exists nowhere else on this universe. It's just right here between us. And as we're talking, these relationships of energy are switching. They're going from me to Katie, Katie to me, and they are switching places. In fact, if you look at an atom one second, and then you look at it another second, it has changed. We are, if I met somebody, if I met Katie 10 years ago, and then I meet her now, her, every, her, all of her atoms would have changed and recreated that now, I'm, even though I'm meeting, I'm seeing Katie again after 10 years, it's a whole new Katie. Now, they have found this negative, there's negative pull. So if we're having a conversation and I am just so negative and I'm just saying all this negative stuff and Katie's just listening to me, what it's doing is it's pulling all of this relationship of energy, all this positive energy that she has, it's come to me. And it's, you ever talk to somebody and you're like, I feel like after that conversation, I just lost three years of my life. Anybody? Maybe you did. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody? Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Let's give Katie a hand. You, you ever had a conversation with somebody and you, th you said, it is like they just plugged into me and sucked the life out of me? Maybe they did. Because you're around this, this negative energy. Not only is that negative, those negative thoughts and that negative process, it's, it's killing as you're doing that. Your, your brain cells are dying off. And they're, they're saying they're, they're, it's, it's, it's literally killing you, this negativity. But it's also pulling negativity, pull, putting negativity into the person you're talking to and, and acting with. And in essence... Maybe it is taking years off their life. Now, there's a power of words. And I came across this, this, this video. I came across this, and I looked for the video, actually. I came across, I read this, and it's only a minute, like a minute and 27 seconds, but it dictates the power of words. And on every, everything, every living thing is made up of cells. I'm made up of cells. Trees are made up of cells. The The... Food, everything is made up of all these cells, which the cells are made out of molecules. Molecules are made out of atoms. So maybe let's see how our words affect those, those other things with cells. Can we show that video? Do we have sound? experiment. He placed rice into three glass beakers and covered it with water. And then every day for a month, he said, thank you to one beaker. You're an idiot to the second. And the third one, he completely ignored. After one month, the rice that had been thanked began to ferment, giving off a strong, pleasant aroma. The rice in the second beaker turned black. And the rice that was ignored began to rot. Dr. Emoto thinks that this experiment provides an important lesson, especially with regard to how we treat children. We should take care of them, give them attention, and converse with them. Indifference does the greatest harm. Crazy, huh? 
Dream is story. Like this is think if that <laughs> the effect it has on rice and but all through on YouTube you can find other people doing these these um these experiments. We are the the Lloyd family is going to do this experiment. We'll tell you our results, but all through um, on YouTube it is and it's crazy if it does that to rice what is it doing to the people that we are coming in contact with? What is it doing to us? For those that talk, you, the, the negativity that you have is all about yourself. Man, you're, I'm so stupid. I'm so dumb. I'm such an idiot. Why do I keep doing that? Why? And you are killing yourself with those negative words. And um, is it, um, I know I've got it here. Yeah, Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death. How true that is. And all of those things that are connected and all those things that are around us. Now, here's the thing. God, through this, we see that God is moving us forward. The universe that God created is also in this process of moving us forward, right? We are in this timeline. We cannot... In this timeline, we cannot go backwards. We can only go forward, and the universe is pulling us forward. Now, if atoms bond with other atoms, make molecules, and molecules make cells, and now we have us human beings, what is the next step of this? Who do we bond with? Other humans. Steve, I'll draw you. The, how this whole thing works is God is putting us together and bonding us together. The whole thing, the whole universe is moving us forward. Moving us forward. Racism is not just unethical, is not just unmoral. It is the failure to bond with other like elements and substances. How about if we had an atom, and Adam said, I'm just not going to bond with those other atoms, and he just went on his own. We'd be like, crazy, you're just an atom. Now, failure, when we, that is failure to bond. Now, as God is, is this whole universe thing, this thing will not stay on, is moving us forward through this, we, things are becoming more and more complex. Things we are learning more and more stuff. Things that we used to think were okay, we are now finding out that it's not. How many of you went downtown yesterday for the 5 o'clock children's sacrifice. No? Nope. Some of you just laughed at a child sacrifice joke. Just saying. It's pretty good. That was my, I, I was hoping more of y'all would laugh. You went down to the child sacrifice thing? But years ago, thousands of years ago, child sacrifice was something that a lot of people did. How many, of, how many are opposed to slavery? This would be a good, like, 100% hands raised thing, just saying. But a couple hundred years in this nation, slavery existed. We are finding out things that we used to think was okay. Now we wouldn't even imagine those things. Why? Because God is moving us forward. The, the book of Leviticus is, is not this barbaric book, but it is God moving the people of Israel forward into something that is new. Yeah. Now, this is a circle, and this is a rectangle. Thank you very much. <laughs> this circle will never be a rectangle. The rectangle will never be a circle. They're different. Now, in this two-dimension world, we are in a three-dimensional world, but in this two-dimensional world of just seeing the height and the width, we see these. Now, if you take this marker, this marker, if you look at it this way, it is a rectangle. It's a rectangle. And you would say, and if you could only see this way, and if you were in a two-dimensional world, you'd be like, that is 100% a rectangle. Now, if you were saying that, and then there were some other people from this side of it in this two-dimensional world, and they saw this marker, what would they say it is? A it's a circle. 
No, it's a rectangle. No, it's a circle. How, how can you see that as a rectangle? How can you not see that as a circle? How, how, can you, how can you see that as a circle? And we go back and forth and back and forth. Who's right? Both of us. Now, if I was opposed of human beings, if I was opposed of people bonding, I would highlight these perspectives and these differences and these different areas, and I would try to highlight these and think, if they are not like you, then they are not for you. And we have had so much bloodshed, so much division on rectangle, circle, rectangle, circle. It, it, it's, we're a rectangle. We have four more rights than you. Get it? Four rights? But we're a circle, man. We're all about love. We're all about peace. We're, we're a circle, man. Perfect together, unity circle. Well, we're a rectangle, and we have more straight lines. Yeah, man, but you're, you're really close to being a square. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and we have people, we have churches and denominations and, and fighting against rectangle, circle, rectangle, circle. And the answer to it is, yep. It's a rectangle, yep. Circle, yep. We're all in this together, yep. But we sit here and we fight and don't bond because rectangle, circle, rectangle, circle. Yeah. I feel like God sometimes is like, I gave you the marker trick. What? What's wrong? What's it? And we fight and we, we have division because of that. And in this, and there, there, there is proof now, there is scientific proof, psych, psychology has proof that when there is a, a victim, if, some, if somebody, when, when you steal and you're, or the perpetrator of, of, of theft, you are, you're the person that stole or the person that abused somebody, not only does it affect psychologically the, the victim, but it also psychologically affects the perpetrator, the person committing that act. And what happens is over time they become numb, and over time they just become less and less and less human. And there are many places in the Bible that we see this on display, but one of the places that I see it on display so much is First and Second Kings and God's people, Israel's people, that have been taken out of exile, taken out of slavery of Egypt. They're in the promised land, and now... First, and if we go to 1 Kings, we see that the reign of King David has ended. David has died, and he has now, um, his son Solomon is in charge of this kingdom. Now, what do we know about Solomon? One thing that we, we hear about Solomon, and everybody talks about Solomon, is the gift that God gave him. Wisdom. 100% from God. We also know that he also built the temple, the temple that David, his father, um, collected the resources and the funds for this temple for God. Now, wisdom, he got wisdom. Is it possible for to, the gift that God has given you, for it to be manipulated and used for not good things? It's possible, right? It happens all the time. Here's King Solomon that loves God, but he then he goes and he marries Pharaoh's daughter. And then when he marries, marries Pharaoh's daughter, he starts to see the things and the things that Egypt starts to do. And then we, we see in, in 2 Kings, no, is it 2 Kings? Sorry. 1 Kings 9, 15, we see where Solomon is building the temple. And what is he using to build the temple? He's using slaves. Now, from a people that they just, God has just redeemed them. God has just taken them out of slavery so many years ago from Egypt. And now, here's King Solomon using to build something for God is using slave labor. And, not, and you're like, well, they, you know, they were people that are working for him. Well, you can find every excuse, but it says they are forced labor. Forced Labor. Now, through this, we, we start to see if these, these people becoming less and less 
human unless and unless and farther away from God. Now, not only is King Solomon, he's like, well, I like my Egyptian wife. So he starts marrying all these different wives from all these different religions and different cultures. And he, he starts to, to um, bond with their gods and starts to build their shrines. He's built the temple. Here's, here's, here's some proof of it. Anybody know how long it took for Solomon to build the temple for the Lord? Seven years. Seven years. You know how long it took him to build his palace after the temple was built? Thirteen years. Using slaves for both. He, he started with focusing on God, but then it all became about him. And it became about Solomon. And he started building these idols and started worshiping these idols. Now, after Solomon, after he died, the kingdom of Israel was left to his son. Um, now, his son, they weren't real happy about this. Solomon had treated people pretty bad. People said, are you going to treat us as bad as your, your dad did? And he said, my dad used whips. I'm going to use scorpions. No idea what that means. I do not know how you use a scorpion. I don't want to know how you use a scorpion. But he said, we'll use scorpions. And they said, all right, we are going to divide. And there's a guy named Jeroboam. He comes in and he says, you know what? I'm going to take this kingdom away from you. And now Judah and Israel are divided. Solomon's son is over Judah. Jeroboam is over Israel. And Jeroboam starts introducing not only all these idols that King Solomon had built, but he starts introducing other gods and other things. And Israel starts to become worse and worse and less less human. And then there's... we. All, the story, a very famous story about um, king, this became a king of Israel named Ahab, and he married this, this woman named Jezebel. And all the evil things that they, have, they did, there was this guy named uh, Naboth who um, King Ahab wanted his property, and Naboth was like, no, man, this is my property. I'm not going to sell you the property. The king we got, came home to his palace. He got mad. He was like, man, I can't believe it. His queen, Queen Jezebel, was like, why are you so mad? He's like, his property. It's like, you're the king, do something about it. And then Queen Jezebel had him killed so that they could take his property. There were prophets. There were so many false prophets in First and Second Kings. You know why? Because they were, if you prophesied anything other than what the kings wanted to hear, you would be put on display. They would hang, the Bible says they would hang the prophets by their thumbs. No idea how you hang somebody by his thumbs. Seems like it would just come out, but they hung them by his thumbs. They would kill these prophets. So all these prophets just learned, all right, I'm just going to I'm going to prophesy things that they want to hear. And then there came this guy, this prophet. His name was um, Micaiah. And Micaiah, he, he was still prophesying the things of God. And he came and he prophesied. And he said, this kingdom is going to go down. And there was a prophet, um, Zedekiah. Zedekiah, now that... This other prophet is saying things opposite than what he's saying. He's like, I got to do something about this or they're going to know I'm a false prophet. And the Bible says he got up and he walked over and he slapped the other prophet. And they have, they believe they have found a picture of this actual event taking place. There was so much famine in the land. There was so much famine in the land at the time. Uh, they, would, they were selling, they were in Israel, they were selling, a donkey head would be equivalent to $50. Anybody want to buy a donkey head for 50 bucks today? Take it home, have a feast tonight? Yeah. They would sell dove dung, a pint of dove dung, for equivalent of $3. Anybody want to buy some dove dung? We're going to have a fundraiser, so a dove dung fundraiser for the, um, kids, the kids' center. Want to donate to that? There's this one story. Oh, one of my personal favorites. There's these two women, all right? These two women. And one woman had a baby boy. The other woman had a baby boy. They lived together. They're hungry, okay? They're like, I mean, I am tired of eating dub dung. You had a baby. I had a baby. So this one, this one lady, the one mom goes to the other mom and says, how about this? That baby there, your baby, how about if we cook and eat that baby tonight for dinner? And then tomorrow, we'll cook and eat my baby. The mom says, deal. That night, they cook and eat her baby. The next morning, she gets up. She's like, man, I am stuffed on baby. And she goes, and she's like, I can't wait to have 
baby tonight. And she goes, and that lady, she is gone. She has left. She's went out of there. This mom now is upset. She goes into the city. She sees the king of Israel, and she is mad. And he's like, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? And she's like, I need justice. Because, you see, my runic, she tells the story just like it is and says, I need you, king, to go find that woman and bring her back so we can eat her baby. How far have they gone? And by the way, it says they boiled the baby and ate it. And I'm not, listen, I'm not going to be eating no baby anytime soon. But if I did, I do not think the best way would be boiling the baby. Like you got rotisserie, you got barbecue, you got, like, just saying this. In 2 Kings 11, in 2 Kings 11, there was this queen, her name, um, Athaliah, Athaliah, she was actually Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. She married the king of Judah. Now the king of Judah died. She was, she became the queen. Now what she did, she's like, I want to be queen. I like this position. And now I know if one of my grandkids, if there's any grandkids, they're going to take the throne. So she went out and she killed every one of her grandchildren except one because that, um, that, that her aunt saved that child, which ended up becoming the king of Israel. Second King 17 was this king um, of Judah, Manasseh. And Manasseh, what he did is he took these idols that Solomon built and worshipped, and he moved them idols into the temple of God. And then uh, in the valley of Hinnah, he built this, this shrine to the god Molech, and they would sacrifice babies to this god. They were, they, when things were so bad, they were like, we're not sacrificing enough babies. So what they did, they started cutting open pregnant women and taking their babies to sacrifice more babies. They, and if you aren't saying that, is not becoming less and less human. At the end, when Israel was coming to the end and the Babylonians were about to conquer Israel, they had tunnels underground and they would go underground to get away from the Babylonian army and here we have 800 years after the Israelites entered to the promised land, they were back in exile. They were back in exile. Now, here's the thing. If you were just reading this creation story, you would have been the people that just came out of slavery of Egypt. Because most people, they believe that Moses wrote wrote Genesis, and if you were reading this, you would notice this thing of happening, of God creating, and then God partnering with his creation to create more, but then what you would notice is on day seven, he rested, and this would have been a big deal to the Israelites at that time, because their entire life, they worked seven days a week as slaves in Egypt, it was just brick, brick, brick brick and their worth was tied to that work and here is the story of our creator he was saying yeah I'm going to give you I'm going to create things I want to partner with you in the creation but then I want you to slow down and I want you to enjoy what we have created I want you to slow you know it's possible to get so so wrapped up in work that is for God that it just consumes you and then all of a sudden you have just found yourself in another type of exile there's this around the Lloyd household I've noticed my kids and my wife saying this phrase that goes like daddy dada Dad, dad, baby, babe, Jimmy. And at first I was like, oh my gosh, they're always calling my name. But then one day I was just like, you know what? It takes about three times for them to get my attention because there's so many times that I'm with them, but I'm not present. Just in case you want a confirmation. It's so easy to get wrapped up in 
emails and the telephone calls I have to make and the meetings I just got done with or the meetings I got to do and so wrapped up in what needs to happen at the church or what needs to happen uh, somewhere else or what that I fail to be present and listen God doesn't he has not created us just to constantly brick 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 but what was happening with me is I was finding myself by not being present I was finding myself in a whole different kind of exile God wants us to be present in the moment. He is moving, the whole universe and everything that God has is moving us forward. It's pulling us forward. Yeah, Jesus says the things that you're going to do are going to be greater. I know you like talking about when I walked on water. I know you like talking about when I fed the 5,000. The things I have for you are going to be greater. In other words, I'm going to pull you forward into the great so easy to want to go back and he's saying no that's not the way I'm pulling you forward everything evidence in the universe and everything that he has and everything that he is about is us bonding together and pulling us forward but at the same time us being present and enjoying what he has given us my brothers and sisters go on May you speak life into those that you encounter. May you treat the creation in the same way that you love the creator. May the eyes of your heart be open. And may you slow down and fully be present right here, right now, so that you may see that he is in everything and that Jesus is all around you.